This is a picture of when I got my first ever mechanical keyboard, taken in something like 2013, back when mechanical keyboards were still relatively unknown, but slowly starting to surface through the competitive gaming scene on YouTube as well as live streams. It was the non-backlit version of the Razer Black Widow, which back then had genuine Cherry MX Blue switches, and it was my first time ever using a mechanical keyboard, and I definitely enjoyed it. However, one day I happened to drop something really heavy on it, and one of the keys stopped working. But luckily, it was still covered by the warranty, although since Razer no longer made the keyboards with genuine Cherry MX switches, the store I bought it from said that they couldn't no, fix it, it and as a replacement, they offered the 2014 Black Widow instead, which had Razer's own Kale switches, but since I had already done quite a lot of additional research into mechanical keyboards at the time, I asked them if they could just give me a different keyboard for around the same price instead, and they agreed. The keyboard I asked for was the Cooler Master Quickfire XT, not only because it looked nice and solid, as well as minimalistic, but more importantly because it had a standard layout, meaning that the modifier keys on the bottom row all had standard sizes, which in turn meant that I could also buy aftermarket keycaps and have them be perfectly compatible with this keyboard. The reason this was such a big deal was because at the time, almost all gaming keyboards, aka pretty much all the available mechanical keyboards, had irregular bottom rows, for which it was really hard to find compatible PPT keycap sets for reasonable prices, meaning that if you did buy a standard aftermarket keycap set, it would most likely end up looking something like this, where the bottom row still has the old keycaps because the new ones you just bought aren't compatible with such irregular layouts. The reason you might want to buy aftermarket keycaps at all is first of all to of course customize the appearance of the keyboard, but also the other part of it, which was a big deal to me, was the fact that the keycaps of almost all the gaming keyboards at the time were made out of cheap ABS plastic, which meant that over time the keycaps would start to shine as well as look and feel oily, which is something that I personally really dislike. However, keycaps made out of PPT plastic do not have that issue because they're much more durable and generally speaking, PPT keycaps are also much thicker, have a rougher texture and overall just feel higher quality, meaning that they also might change the overall feel as well as sound of the keyboard, which is something that I wanted to try out for myself and now that I was about to receive the Quickfire XT, that just became a potential possibility. Except that it actually kinda didn't because I received the variant with the ISO layout, for which it was even more difficult to find aftermarket keycaps. But since the keyboard was brand new anyway, I wasn't really in a hurry to switch out the keycaps regardless, and aside from the ISO layout, overall I quite liked the keyboard and it was also my first experience using MX Browns, which I don't really remember if I liked more than MX Blues, but at least it was interesting to try them out. At this point, I started getting really into mechanical keyboards. I was doing research almost daily about the various keyboards, keycaps and key switches out there, and something I discovered were the old buckling spring keyboards, which apparently were catastrophically clicky to the extent that some considered them to be by far the most tactile keyboards out there, and I definitely wanted to try them out. Unfortunately though, they were quite expensive, especially when considering that when ordering them here, the shipping and toll fees will almost double the price of the keyboard itself. So I made a post on the Estonian internet asking if anyone perhaps has any old keyboards laying around and somebody actually offered me an old IBM Model M2 for only 5 euros which was really epic. I was a bit concerned that it actually might be broken as apparently it's common for the M2 variant to have issues with the capacitors and when I finally received it, sure enough when I plugged in its PS2 connector to my computer, it didn't work but came out that all I had to do was just restart my computer as apparently that's what you have to do with these old PS2 connectors, after which it started working perfectly fine and I had myself a fully working buckling spring keyboard from IBM. And it was definitely an incredibly clicky keyboard. When typing fast, every click popped to the extent that it felt like tiny explosions at your fingertips, making it a really different experience compared to Cherry MX based switches and it was definitely a really amazing feeling keyboard. Also, while this of course wasn't a Cherry MX based keyboard, it was still my first experience with PPT keycaps and I wanted to clean them so I decided to put them to the test and boil them, which should have been fine because PPT has a really high melting point, but unfortunately, the Dysa printed legends got slightly damaged from that and one of the keycaps must have touched the bottom of the pot or something because it got this scorch mark at a specific location so yeah, I don't really recommend boiling your keycaps. At one point, I I also somehow managed to mangle the spring of the K key and while that key still worked, it wasn't really clicky anymore. 
Anyway, while the BBT keycaps and buckling spring switches were definitely an interesting experience, overall, the rest of the keyboard wasn't actually super solid though, as unlike the tank which is the original Model M, the M2 variant is really lightweight and not gonna lie, feels a bit cheap. And it was also probably the loudest keyboard I've ever used, which personally I don't mind, but it was definitely annoying to people around me. I also still found myself reaching for the Cooler Master keyboard as well, as occasionally it was just a bit easier to use compared to the Buckling Swing keyboard, especially during gaming and such, and it just felt a bit more solid as well. If I were to make a tier list of all the keyboards I've covered thus far, I'd consider the M2 to be a light A or a strong B, as despite its buckling spring switches, its housing was honestly just holding it back from being a complete keyboard in a sense. But to be honest, I think it's still worth the A tier due to how epic the buckling spring switches were. I'd put the Cooler Master Quickfire XT to the top of the B tier, as at the time, I considered it to be the best gaming keyboard at its price point, especially due to its design and standard layout, and finally, the Razer I'd put into the C tier, not necessarily because I didn't enjoy it, but because it had an irregular bottom row. At this point, there was actually something else that started piquing my interest as well, namely Topra keyboards. The interesting thing about Topra is the fact that they're actually not mechanical at all, in the sense that they're electrocapacitive and for their tactility they use rubber domes. Despite this, however, a lot of keyboard enthusiasts at the time considered Topra to be on a completely different level compared to Cherry MX based switches to the extent that it became the end game for many of them as they pretty much never wanted to go back to Cherry MX based switches once they tried Topra. This mixed with the unique sound of Topra as well as the unique Topra keyboards themselves really made me want to try them out myself as well. At first I wanted the Leopold FC660C but eventually I got more and more intrigued by the notorious HHKB which is actually probably one of the most controversial keyboards out there as due to its unorthodox layout as well as plastic casing it's a prime example of love it or hate it. However, since Topra keyboards are once again pretty expensive, I had to sell both the Cooler Master as well as the IBM Model M2, for which I was able to buy a second-hand HHKB Pro 1 from 2004, which is actually a pretty rare variant and it cost me around $180. But when it finally arrived, I unexpectedly had to pay another 45 euros in toll fees as the seller sent it from Korea and despite me asking them to lower the value of the package, they unfortunately forgot to do that. But regardless, it was my first time ever being able to try out a Topra keyboard. I remember that on first sight, when I took it out of the box, I was surprised at how tiny it was in real life. I guess I had watched so many videos of the HSKB that somehow it gave me the false impression that it would be much bigger. Also, this was in something like early 2015, so I honestly think that I might have been the only person in Estonia who had a Topra keyboard, because I had searched through pretty much every keyboard forum out there, and I couldn't find a single Estonian in any context whatsoever, yet alone someone that owns a Topra keyboard. Years later, I actually did find some Estonians, but back when I was most active, I might have been one of the only people in Estonia who was into this hobby at all. Anyway, I definitely liked the Topra keyboard. It was quite interesting in the sense that despite the switches being technically relatively light, the tactility was still incredibly pronounced, yet somehow they also felt really smooth at the same time, leading to an incredibly satisfying type experience. I also don't remember having any issues with getting used to the HHKB layout as even the arrow key cluster was extremely easy to use thanks to the well-placed function key. However, the case of this particular HSKB wasn't actually perfectly solid as it was a bit rattly as well as creaky, so to combat this I put these pieces of paper between the case, after which it honestly felt fine and despite it being so plasticky, it didn't feel cheap the way the M2 did as it really felt like the use of plastic was more by design rather than as a cost saving measure. But of course, despite having already tried out end game tier switches such as Buckling Springs and Topra, there was still so much I was curious about. For example, Back then, the only quote-unquote acceptable Cherry MX based switches on the market were the genuine Cherry MX switches by Cherry itself. Clones such as Gale and Otomu did exist even back then, but at the time, they hadn't invented anything new or innovated in any way, so essentially they were just low-quality versions of the common Cherry MX switches and that's it. 
However, a new Switch maker called Gatoran had slowly started establishing itself in the keyboard scene, and they were the only ones to bring any actual innovation to the existing Cherry MX based Switches. Not only did they introduce two new Switch types, but more importantly, straight out of the box Gatoran Switches were considered much smoother than Cherry Switches, especially when it came to the linears such as Gatoran Blacks, which now rivaled the incredibly rare vintage Cherry MX Blacks, which were formerly considered as the kings of smoothness. I had never tried linear switches before, and I knew that some people considered Vintage Blacks or Gatoran Blacks as the only Cherry MX based switch that they liked as much as Topra, so I definitely wanted to try them out as well. At the same time, there was also another keyboard about to release called the Poker 3, which featured a 60% layout, PBT keycaps, as well as a metal case straight out of the box, and it came at a completely reasonable price even in Europe, making it an extremely solid, high quality keyboard at an unbeatable price point. So my plan was to buy the Poker 3 with Cherry MX Blues and then swap them out for Gatoran Blacks by first desoldering the Blues and then soldering on the Gatorans. But before I could do any of that, I had to sell my HSKP to afford that, which I did, and after a really long and painful wait, I finally received both the Poker and the Gatoran Blacks. My first impression was the surprise at how lacking the click of the MX Blues felt compared to what I remembered. I hadn't used MX Blues for like years at this point, so maybe I just remembered them wrong, or perhaps the thick PBT keycaps of the Poker muffled the tactility, but regardless, I was going to swap them out for Gatoran Blacks anyway. Little did I know, however, that it was going to be a really long and painful experience as it was my first time soldering and it took me quite a while before I figured out a smooth way to go about it. I actually even broke off a few contact pads which I had to fix with some really thin wiring and that process was finicky to the extent that I was surprised when it actually worked. But at one point I also managed to short the entire keyboard making it unable to turn on but luckily after I removed some random lead that had fallen onto one of the connectors, it started working again, and I finally had myself a fully functioning poker tree with Gator and Black switches. I also put a few LEDs into the corners just because I knew that the PCB supported them, so I wanted to try them out. Overall, the keyboard itself was super solid and also sounded really good, especially with the new switches. But in a way, I felt like the Gator and Blacks weren't as smooth as I expected. While they were definitely smoother than Cherry switches, they had this issue where they got slightly stuck due to friction or wobbliness, which ironically made them feel a bit scratchy in those scenarios. Not only that, but unfortunately, the Blacks were a bit too heavy heavy for me, and since the deeper you press, the heavier they get, they honestly felt kind of mushy. So at least for me, it wasn't my favorite experience, and to make matters even worse, now I know that I will never buy a keyboard with this kind of a 60% layout ever again. The reason why is because the position of the function key, mixed with the traditional arrow cluster, made it extremely difficult to use the arrow keys as well as the other keys hidden under the function layer. I actually find it really ironic since this kind of a 60% layout is uncomparably more common and less controversial compared to the HSKB layout, yet for me, this traditional 60% layout was really painful to use, while as the HSKB layout felt just completely natural and very pleasant. The easiest way to fix it would be to just shrink the right shift a bit and to add a tiny function key next to it, just like on the HSKB. Speaking of the HSKB, I actually started missing it so badly that I ended up regretting selling it, especially considering that the rarity of the Pro 1 made its prices go up quite a lot as well as it slowly started becoming a collector's item. So this time I bought the HSKB Pro 2 and eventually I sold the Poker 3 as I ended up just using the HSKB most of the time anyway. But of course when I was selling the Poker I offered to change the escape key from an MX Blue to a Gator and Black which I had purposely left untouched before and during the soldering process I somehow managed to hit the number one key with the soldering iron which left a pretty big melt mark on it, so as compensation, I decided to send the buyer an extra USB cable. So at this point, I was mostly just using the HSKB, which I was pretty happy with, but I also started wondering that if I were to design my own keyboard layout, what would it be like? I was curious to find the answer to this, so I tried using some layout editing software, and eventually I ended up with a 65% layout like this. 
Nowadays, this exact layout is rather common, but I think at the time, while there were similar ones such as the Leopold FC-660C or the extremely expensive and hard to get 75% dark octagon, there wasn't anything pre-made that was exactly the same and available for purchasing. However, I found this company called Ortolinear Keyboards, primarily known for making the 40% keyboard known as the Plank, who were also selling a plate called the Neutrino, which had the exact layout I was looking for. The issue, however, was that not only were the plate and the other related parts really hard to get, but also the fact that the plate was designed to be used for hand wiring a keyboard, which is basically the most difficult way to go about making a custom keyboard. Essentially, it means that you have no PCB, so you have to wire everything to a tiny microcontroller all by yourself, as well as edit and flash custom firmware that corresponds to how you personally wired it. But I had no other choice, so I decided to seek out all the required parts, which ended up being so difficult that it felt like I was trying to gather the 5 cards of the Exodia or something, but eventually, after hundreds of hours over multiple years, I had finally built myself the Neutrino, and I was genuinely very satisfied with it. The full story of this keyboard is so long that I'm not going to be covering it in this video at all, but for now, I can say that it ended up becoming an extremely solid and heavy duty compact keyboard that feels way better than any of the other Cherry MX boards that I've ever used. And since I put so much time and effort into this keyboard, I eventually decided that I should just daily drive it over everything else, which is why, once again, I sold my HSKB. And that was, once again, a huge mistake because I ended up regretting it just like before, so a year and a half later, I bought myself another HSKB, and I think the moral of the story is just to never sell your HSKB. This was now my third HSKB, and I also think it's the most interesting one thus far as well. It's actually another Pro 1 model, but this time it's from 2003, making it even more rare than the previous one I had, and the funny thing is that it only cost me 120 euros, which at least at the time was incredibly cheap. The reason it was so cheap was, first of all, because it was missing a spring for one of the keys, but the real reason why was because the previous owner had spray painted the HSKB three times, and I wouldn't really call any of the coats of paint perfect. On the final white coating, they also sprayed over the back label, which I eventually tried cleaning by just scraping the paint off, but little did I know, it also removed the model information, which I find really unfortunate. Ironically though, this HSKB is the nicest feeling HSKB I've ever had, as the terrible paint job actually made the case not creak at all, so it ended up just being more solid. I've also been thinking of restoring this HSKB as close as possible to its original state by removing the paint somehow for years now, but I honestly just haven't bothered as from afar, the white and black aesthetic isn't too bad either, and the keyboard feels amazing regardless. At this point, I was using my homemade keyboard in the office and the HSKB at home, and I kind of stopped doing any kind of research towards mechanical keyboard keyboards for around two years, after which I kind of wanted to try a full-sized keyboard with a compact layout, so I bought the iQnix F96 Knight with once again Cherry MX Blues. The reason I went with MX Blues again was because there wasn't much else of a choice anyway, and I was feeling kind of nostalgic for some old-school clicky cherry switches, and I gotta admit, despite having a HSKB and my homemade keyboard with box royals, I actually enjoyed the MX Blues as well, to the extent that I used the F96 for around a year as well, but when I finally tried the HSKB again, I once again realized that out of everything I've tried, nothing comes even close to how much I like the HSKB. I almost feel bad because now I've been using it nearly exclusively for over a year, during which I haven't even touched any of my other keyboards at all, and needless to say, at this point I lost almost all interest towards buying, researching, or customizing keyboards because I really feel like there isn't anything out there for me anymore, as at the end of the day, I'll most likely just enjoy the HSKB. HSKB more than whatever maxed out custom Cherry MX based endgame board I could come up with. The only thing I kind of wanna try are looped premium linear switches such as tangerines with their springs swapped for very long lightweight springs which give them a flatter force curve, but I'm honestly scared to even set out on a journey to even try that as not only will it be really expensive, but looping switches takes an incredible amount of time and I suspect that in the end it doesn't even matter because I'll most likely just like my terribly painted 20 year old disc count HSKB more regardless. And I don't know, perhaps after having sold and bought this keyboard three times, 
maybe, just maybe, it's a sign that this keyboard truly is my endgame board. And with that kind of a mindset, I've done nearly a non-existent amount of research into keyboards for over 5 years, despite having been incredibly passionate towards them in the past. While making this video, I did do quite a lot of catching up though, and it's crazy how much this landscape has changed. Nowadays, there are seemingly thousands of different Cherry MX based switches, and overall, custom mechanical keyboards have become incredibly popular despite them having been incredibly misunderstood just some years prior. Personally though, I don't have any plans on selling my HSKB or buying new keyboards, but I feel a bit sad that I've sort of given up on my hand wire keyboard simply because I'd rather use the HSKB to do the Topra switches. It's also a keyboard that I'll obviously never sell, and I've put so much time and passion into it that I wish it was at least on parallel with the HSKB. So perhaps I should come out of my keyboard retirement for one last final time to find the perfect Cherry MX base switch that manages to match Topra if such a thing even exists, because currently, if we go back to the tier list, the HSKB is just on a tier of its own. So those were my keyboard adventures thus far, and while there is obviously a lot more to it than I covered in this video, I'm going to make a follow-up video in a completely different format where I'll go over each keyboard I currently own, as well as clean and fix them, because they're actually all broken right now, so until then, I hope to see you in that video.